Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our ITB Future Web Track. We learned a lot this morning about the needs of skills. No surprise, we urgently need skills, we need digital skills, sustainable skills, social skills, transferable skills. And there we do have the link to our next session. We talk about this, what we already heard, employee experience design, sector attractivity, in travel and further, further, further out of other industries. Employee branding, of course, as well. And that's the topic, topic for the next hour, and we do have great guests. Uh, I start with my colleague, with Madeleine Schwing. She's research associate at the Catholic University of Eichstätt, Ingolstadt. Madeleine, welcome on stage. You're the moderator, moderator for the session. You have a great list of guests. You have a great list of topics. So happy to learn more about corporate culture now. Thank you very much, Dirk. Yeah, welcome also from my side to this panel, Leading the Change, Corporate Culture and Future Workforce. Really great that you're all here despite the strike. And, uh, but before we start with the panel, I'll give you a short introduction and also to our um, panelists. Um, so in general, what is it about? In the transformative landscape of tourism, leaders are facing really um, challenges in preparing for the future of their, for their organizations. In a time of multiple challenges, such as sustainability, technological change, and also political uncertainties, it is really um, crucial to develop a corporate culture that is adaptable, fosters innovation, and also inspires employees to embrace change. Um, in this panel, we will delve into discussions uh, regarding the future of work, corporate culture, and the important role of leadership. And as I said before, we start really with a discussion. We will have a keynote speech of Bonita Grupp. And Bonita Grupp is managing director of Trigema, Germany's largest manufacturer of sports and leisure wear. Bonita, the floor is yours. Welcome to the stage. Um, yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the ITB in Berlin today. I'm very happy to represent the textile industry here today, an industry that is only rarely present nowadays in Germany's economy. You might ask yourself, how does a representative from a textile company fit onto today's panel about corporate culture and the workforce in the travel and tourism industry? Allow me to briefly introduce myself. Together, my name is Bonita Grupp, and together with my brother, I'm running our family business, Trigema, in the fourth generation. Trigema was founded in 1919 by my great-grandfather, Josef Meyer, as a factory for men's and women's underwear in Bulladingen in southwest Germany. More than 100 years later, our family business, known under the brand name Trigema, still produces and operates at the same location with 1,200 employees from over 40 different nationalities. Production takes place in four stages. Knitting, dyeing, finishing, cutting, sewing, embroidering and printing. Our products such as t-shirts, polo shirts, sweatshirts and sportswear are sold in our own shops across Germany, in our own online store, in, through our online partners, as well as to industry clients and the healthcare sector. With our vertically integrated production, we generate an added value of 80%. This underlines one of our core values, sustainable production, but also allows for flexibility within the range of products that we can manufacture at any time, and if needed, within 48 hours. We aim to keep all processes in-house, even the creation of our own fashion shoots. Matching tourism and travel, our sustainable and environmentally friendly values in combination with our products were recently captured in Iceland. Trigema formt nicht nur Stoff. Trigema verpflichtet sich der Nachhaltigkeit und setzt damit Standards für die Modeindustrie. 
Ein Funke von Vernunft in einer Welt, die oft blind voranschreitet. Jedes Kleidungsstück ist ein Statement für bewusstes Handeln, für achtsamen Konsum, für eine Erde, die wir mit Stolz an die nächste Generation übergeben können. Sie verlangt von uns, heute Entscheidungen zu treffen, die den Lauf der Zeit überdauern werden. Jeder Tag ist eine Chance, jeder Moment eine Gelegenheit, die Welt um uns herum positiv zu beeinflussen. We might be operating in different industries, but we are facing similar challenges regarding our workforce. Our business models still require a lot of detailed manual labor that cannot be automated and often does not allow for home office models. The shifts in working hours that our business models rely on are not always seen as work-life balance friendly or as fitting the new work culture, due to, as in our case, machine shifts and shop opening hours. Our businesses are often located in rural areas, as are many tourist attractions and holiday destinations. Relating to International Women's Day tomorrow, both our industries have a large female workforce. We at our company have a share of 82% and the tourism industry of 54%. Am Internationalen Frauentag ehren wir die Frauen bei Trigema, die den Wandel in der Arbeitswelt vorantreiben. Sie sind das Rückgrat unseres Unternehmens, tragen maßgeblich zum Erfolg von Trigema bei und erschaffen hochwertige Produkte, welche die Menschen seit Jahrzehnten wertschätzen. Auf unsere Frauenquote von 82 Prozent sind wir mehr als stolz. Unsere Bemühungen gehen jedoch weit über die Belegschaft hinaus. Wir investieren in erneuerbare Energiequellen, reduzieren unsere Abfälle und minimieren die Strecke, die unsere Produkte zurücklegen müssen. Alles zum Schutz unseres Planeten. Gemeinsam schaffen wir eine bessere Zukunft für uns alle. Trigema wünscht alles Gute zum Internationalen Frauentag. So how do we adapt to our corporate culture to fit these new ideas and ensure to be an attractive employer despite these challenging circumstances? First of all, it's skills and training. We train up to 40 apprentices every year in a range of professions such as admin staff, seamstresses, knitters and dyers. Most of our managers are former apprentices. As we are part of an industry that rarely exists nowadays in Germany, we also have to train most of our textile production workers on site. Another main point is our international workforce. Due to a lack of skilled labor in the textile sector in Germany and also a general shortage of labor, we also recruit our workforce from abroad. This means that currently our workforce is made up of four, over 40 different nations. In order to integrate them into our company, we offer them German lessons, support with administrative errands and paperwork. We also offer flat shares where we often combine people from many different countries. And what we've learned from the hotel industry is that we're currently investing in our own employee accommodation, building a number of tiny houses, as we are also suffering from a lack of housing and public transportation in the area where we're located. Another important point is in our corporate culture is trust and flat hierarchies. As a production company, we cannot offer much in terms of remote work and very flexible working hours. But what we can offer is long-term employment and trust. Every year, we award prizes to employees that have been with us at the company for 25, 40, or even 50 years. Even during the COVID pandemic, pandemic we did not lay off any workers, despite the fact that our shops had to close. We therefore try to ensure continuity and safety. And um, through this network, it allows us to quickly adapt to challenges and also offers a large degree of flexibility. 
So during the COVID pandemic, when we realized that our shops had to close and suddenly 50% of our sales were gone, we had to restructure our factory and we decided to um, get into mask production. And within 48 hours, we uh, switched our whole production to the production of face masks. Um, this also helped us during episodes of high energy prices in 2022 that we were experiencing in Germany due to the gas prices and us as a production company, especially in our fabric production, are heavily dependent on gas. Um, and through our team effort, we managed to change the way our production was running and to keep the company going. A further point, of course, due to the la um, to, to, um, more and more uh, lack of skilled labor is automization and digitalization. We aim to use the skilled labor that we have for more demanding tasks. Um, whereas for us in the textile industry, automation is still not as uh, broadly accepted as in other industries, such as the car manufacturing, for example, because we work with elastic fabrics. And elastic fabrics means that robots cannot sort of grip them. And um, this means that most of our work is still manual. So every seam you see on a T-shirt or polo shirt has been passed by hand through a machine. This makes, of course, our production very uh, labor intensive. And therefore, we must always keep an eye on technological change. And we're heavily investing in uh, innovation in um, automation and digitalization in this part. One of our main aspects, of course, is that we are a family business and are rooted in a local area for more than 105 years. We therefore have tradition and expertise in textile manufacturing. We have many generations that have worked for us. Current, uh, now, even in the third or fourth generation, we have families that are working with us in the business, um, sometimes even many, a few generations at the same time. And also, we attract families from abroad that are working with us in different departments. Especially at a time of global economic instability and noticeable depletion of natural resources around the world, we at Trigema have the opportunity to show that sustainable production is possible with motivated employees in Germany. We must succeed in reaching those who consciously choose quality, values, and sustainability in their consumer behavior. For over 105 years, Trigema has aimed to maintain its values of local sustainable production in a family business setting, and we aim to preserve this strong corporate culture within our workforce in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonita. Please stay with us, have a seat. Yes, thank you. And I would like to also ask the other panelists to come up to the stage. So please welcome with me Madam Eliza Reed, author and first lady of Iceland and passionate advocate for gender equality. Thank you very much. And Gitta Brückmann, vice president, corporate social responsibility EMEA and Government Affairs Europe at the hotel chain Marriott. Thank you very much. You can take a seat here, please. Okay, thank you. And unfortunately, due to the strike, our fourth panelist cannot be with us today. She had to leave early. But this gives us some time for questions from the audience. So um, when you see the Slido code, you can um, please ask questions later after our discussion. So thank you very much. So. Bonita, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation of Trigema. Um, you ex explained the corporate culture, and but to what extent can leadership uh, contribute to shaping a corporate culture for the future workforce, especially in a family business? And uh, could you maybe provide further insight into your understanding of leadership? And do you believe leadership has to change because of the world is changing, or is this the stable factor? Well, I think um, as we are a family business, what has helped us a lot in the past is that we've have, we have strong values that define our work. And um, these have not changed over the years. So um, my brother and me, we've just recently taken over the um, managing of the company this year. Um, and from my father, who's been running the company for over 50 years. Um, but we've always seen that the values have had a strong influence. So in the past, for example, in the 80s, textile industry in our region in Germany was still very big and has seen a strong decline since then. So we're one of the last companies that still manufacture in Germany. Um, 
therefore, but we've always had our values that kept us going. We've always, nowadays, it's also sustainability that is, of course, part of it, whereas we've always had a local production. We manufacture everything within 70 kilometers. So that's one core factor. And what we've had is, is tradition and stability within the company. So um, our workforce always sees that just whatever the problems were, if it was... Um, uh, COVID or high energy prices or any other crisis that we've had in the past, we always said, okay, we need the support of our employees in good times and in bad times, um, and we've tried to manage it together. And as we have low hierarchies, um, we can always adapt quickly to the things that occur, and we try to think quickly. And yeah, if in future it says, okay, we shouldn't produce T-shirts, but any other product, we're happy to do so as well. Very interesting, thank you. It's about values, sustainability you mentioned. Um, Gitta, that's maybe a good link to you from a family business to big corporation. Um, could you explain the unique role of hospitality in shaping corporate culture? And additionally, are hospitality concepts maybe changing in response to new work? Yes, um, I'd be happy to, but I have to say, um, you know, we consider ourselves also as a family business. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, um, we are a very large hotel company now with almost 9,000 hotels worldwide um, and th over 30 brands, uh, one in Reykjavik, uh, the edition uh, in Reykjavik. But um, some of you might know, and Bonita, you might not know, that Marriott is actually almost 100 uh, years old. In 1927, uh, the founder, J.W. Marriott, um, uh, opened a restaurant, and then the, the business started, the hotel business started in 1957. But uh, to come to the point here, and which is very, very important, um, we have um, also that family business in our DNA. And it gets tougher the bigger you get. <laughs> it gets more difficult, but we have it in our DNA. Um, Mr. Marriott, now the son of the founder, he is over 90, uh, he's still involved. Uh, we have David Marriott, his son, around about 50 in the business, which is also very important to us. Um, again, for us, I'm 38 years with a company. I grew up with a company. It is very, very important to, um, to understand those values. And I just mentioned uh, we have it in our DNA. But to answer your question, um, it is something you can only experience as an associate. We need to walk the talk, you know, this famous saying, we need to walk the talk. We offer certain things in our company, in our culture, uh, in our corporation, uh, and then the, the associate, the team member needs to say, okay, this is the company I would like to uh, work for. And um, why does he or she then decide to stay with the company? Because we feel that we offer opportunities. Not only feel, we offer opportunities. And the opportunities can go in terms of development, making a career, you know, training. Um, I mean, there's a very, very wide field of that. But uh, one last sentence I would like to say, which is very important to us as well, is giving back to the communities. Mm -hmm. We have a system called business councils. And the business councils are 30, over 35 years with Marriott, where we meet on a regular basis, the general managers, but also other uh, leaders in the hotel. And they uh, um, this not only talk about business as such, but they also want to go back to the society. It could be a take care event, um, uh, but it could also be a recognition. I saw the picture when you were recognizing the associates. We do the same also in cities and countries. So uh, it's something... Uh, which is evolving over time, but um, we have it in our DNA. Thank you. From a corporate culture to a nation's culture, <laughs> Eliza, you are the first lady of Iceland, and Iceland has consistently ranked first in the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report. To what extent do female role models contribute to shaping Iceland's culture? and society's sense of fairness, and what lessons can other nations learn from Iceland's culture and also values? It's a very small question. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, thank, thank you very much. And I have to say, Bonita, I loved that advertisement. 
<laughs> extra shout out there for, for filming in Iceland. Uh, I'm sure that those clothes go very well in the country. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. We, we um, have the fortune in Iceland of, of uh, topping the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index for 14 years now which doesn't mean that we have achieved or closed the gender gap. It just means that we are closer to um, uh, than any other country to doing so. And we're the only one that has closed more than 90% of the gap. And, uh, you know, absolutely, I think that that is an important value that we that we have as a country. It's something that we are very proud of. And it, it coincides with a lot of other values. So we're also the world's most peaceful country. And we are the world's most open country for the queer community. And we are the world's uh, third happiest country. Uh, the Finns, it seems, are happier than, than we are in Iceland. But uh, we, we have a lot of these, uh, if you would call them sort of wellness indices on which we score high. And if I can turn that a little bit to how that maybe is relevant to the, the travel and tourism industry, one of the big uh, important buzzwords that we talk about a lot now in travel and tourism is is the word sustainability. And to me, uh, especially when it comes to Iceland, I think a lot of us think of sustainability in Iceland and we think of beautiful nature and the landscapes that you saw in the advertisement there. But to me, sustainability also has to do with a country's values. And that's where I think the fact that we uh, do well in gender equality is very important for the industry because as a consumer, I want to know that when I go and stay at the addition, the staff are being paid a fair wage and, and that they get sick leave and, and that they, uh, you know, that nobody is going to be turned away for their race or their sexual orientation or their sexual identity. Um, and, and that is to me important as, as a user. And I think that consumers are being more particular when, when they are choosing these kinds of destinations. Uh, you asked about role models, and of course role models are important. In the travel and tourism industry, where it's a majority of women working in the industry, we often see that maybe it's a majority of women, um, but a minority of, of women in the senior positions. Uh, our minister of tourism is a woman. The head of our tourism association is a woman. Um, we have a lot of other areas that are led by women, prime minister, bishop of the national church, head of the national police force. And of course that's important so that we see a diversity of people in these various roles in the country. So, so I, I, I think we kind of know the answer to that one, but it is absolutely important in building a good corporate culture is knowing that everybody has a place and everybody should have an opportunity to contribute. Thank you. Gita, we live in a world characterized by uncertainty and risk. There's a lot of fear in these times, also among employees. Um, they are afraid. How do you deal with fear at Marriott? So, I mean, uh, we probably learned the biggest lesson during the pandemic. Um, and, and that was uh, uh, really um, for many of our industries, of course, around the world, uh, a shock. Um, I um, can say that generally, the conversation <laughs> is still the key in our people business, okay? If you ask, you know, how do we take the, the fairness or the, uh, how do you take it away from the people? We have to, uh, uh, and this is what we try, of course, um, uh, we have to make sure that we talk to the individual associates if they have an issue. But in addition to this, we offer mental health not only online workshops, classroom style workshops. There's an app which is called Me Equilibrium, which we can download from a Marriott website. Uh, some people have downloaded it. They can have meditation sessions there. I don't know, everybody has you know, their own uh, way of, of dealing with fear. Uh, but again, personally, I would like to say it is crucial that we communicate to our team members, no matter what level. Um, and uh, as I just said, uh, the training classes is one thing, but the other um, important point is also mentor programs. Um, you know, and some people are very outspoken. They have a, you know, maybe an issue and they say, oh, you know, can we speak to you? And then others, they need to be proactively 
um, or they need to be invited uh, through certain uh, different channels. So, um, yeah, I mean, this this is what we this this is what we do. That's a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bonita, according to the psychologist and resilience expert Gerg Gigerenta, knowledge is the most effective tool against fear. Uncertainty is always with us. It, certainties don't exist anymore. Um, how do you lead and communicate at Trigema at these times of uncertainty and acknowledging that um, yeah, uncertainty is part of life? Um, yes, I think during the past sort of 10 years since I've been part of our business, we've learned a lot about uncertainties, especially as you mentioned with the pandemic. Um, for us, the pandemic, of course, came, I mean, it wasn't a strong hit for us as it was for the hotel industry, but um, for us, we still, we knew that our shops had to close. We didn't know who was going to buy our products, were people still going to buy online if everyone's going to sit at home? Does he or she need a new pair of jogging pants or a t-shirt? We weren't sure. But for us, in order to manufacture in Germany, we have to keep the production going all year round. So we knew, okay, as a family, we knew, okay, we had to, we were just, we, we said we're going to just produce on stock and just hope for better times. No one knew how long it was going to go on for. But what one main point that we learned was communication because what we did on the first day of the pandemic was that um, my father recorded a video recording and we showed it to all of our employees and we said that look no matter what your employment's gonna be safe and we managed not to lay off anyone but we need to stick together and if you know if we require you to do another task then please do so we just need to find a way to keep this going and um, luckily the face masks came and with it because of our employees like the first lockdown in Germany I didn't realize at all because 11 weeks, six days nonstop, we were constantly manufacturing the masks. We had everyone working together. We had people from the um, administrative staff helping in production after they finished with their work. We all came in on Saturdays to help. It was a great team effort. And I think this is what makes things possible. If you communicate, you know, and if you sort of try, even in certain, certain times, that's very difficult for leaders as well, but to sort of try and give a form of stability, because then at least you know your ship is sort of sailing one direction. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Eliza, we just heard about um, risk, uncertainties, and um, I would like to come back to, to leadership also. And you mentioned uh, the many le female leaders you have in Iceland. Um, what role does female leadership play in these times and how does it make a difference? Well, I, I think that all, you know, we need a diversity of leadership all the time because it's important that we have diverse viewpoints to stop ourselves from, uh, you know, thinking in the same kind of, kind of silo mentality. That's how we get innovation, creativity, development, it is to have these different viewpoints coming forward. and. Um, you know, female leadership, I never like generalizing and saying female leaders are like this and male leaders are like that because I, I, I don't know that that is particularly productive. But I, I think that societies sometimes tend to value what are perceived as male leadership characteristics versus female leadership characteristics. And we need to, I think, work to really uh, take on these kind of welcoming positions in both ways. And I'm thinking of small examples like in in meetings where uh, to completely generalize, and, and I don't mean to be unfairly, you know, maybe women are less likely to speak up or, or you know, apologize before they start speaking or sort of say, well, I just have a small point. It's not really very important and kind of minimize uh, what they're saying before they say it. And, and, and I think one of these key things and why it's important to have not one person who is some kind of a token, but a lot of people, is so that someone else can say, I really like Benita's point there, I'd like to reiterate that and give her credit for her idea. Um, and, and I, I, you know, but all, any kinds of leadership is important. We as human beings, we tend to fit the mold of what we know, what we're familiar with, what we grew up with, whatever that is. And when we're making teams and we're forming committees, it's very easy for us to think, well, I worked with so-and-so, I grew up with so-and-so, uh, that's who I should have on my team. And in fact, we should have somebody different from us uh, in, in whatever way that is. And overall, as we all know, that brings more money to the bottom line. And in an area like travel and tourism, 
where it's constantly changing, the end consumer is really kind of constantly changing what they're looking for, what is popular, how we, um, how we tackle different challenges, how we innovate and cr come up with new things. Of course, diversity is, is incredibly important in that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask one more question. Um, also, yeah, has to do with risks and uncertainty, but also hopes um, to Bonita and, and, and Gitta, maybe a short, short answer. Um, it's about technology and AI in tourism. Um, sometimes technology brings hope to people, but some may be also afraid to use that and maybe they have, there's a risk to lose their jobs maybe. Um, what does technology mean to you and how do you deal with interfaces of people and machines at your company? Maybe Bonita, do you want uh, first? Um, as I mentioned, our industry is still very manual labor focused, but um, for us it's important to embrace technology in this area because we are facing a strong shortage of employ uh, employees. Um, therefore, we've um, tried to use a lot of digitalization in the past, and what we've learned is that um, we have always key users, you know, who then introduce um, the other employees to the, uh, to the um, technology. And, um, we try to sort of, you know, show that it's positive for you, you know, and we're, we're showing, look, your employment is not in any danger because of this, but you have to try and use it. And especially during the pandemic, when we were suddenly switching production to masks and everything, we saw that without, in the past, we could not have delivered this kind of, like, that many millions of masks without having embraced the technology before. So this all helped us and it showed everyone that it actually helps us in the end and uh, makes us deliver an even better product. And I think that's important to show. Gita? Yeah, just in short, I mean, as I said, we're in the people business hotel, so you have to have a chef in the kitchen, but even the chef um, uh, uses technology now to if we talk about sustainability, to look into our food waste, where we want to reduce our food waste when we talk about sustainability. So um, on, uh, this is just one uh, example. The guest who checks in books via may, may be the, or hopefully the Merit Bonvoy app, uh, he or she checks in. Uh, how do they check in digitally? So our people need to be uh, trained on certain systems, um, but at the same time we need to find the balance that it's not uh, too much, <laughs> because we are uh, we still hope to look into the guests' eyes to welcome them and and uh, serve them. Right? I mean, this is our core. <laughs> this is our core business. But technology, of course, plays a role. AI plays a role, you know, I mean, we are looking as a company, uh, of course, also, I mean, how can we optimize our uh, services with guest needs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to be up to speed, no question. <laughs> Am I allowed to add a bit here? I, I just want to add something. I'm please, so sorry. Please. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm good. Um, you know, I w Iceland has been taking part in ITB for many, many years now, but this is the first year that we have two stands because we also are taking part in the tech, the travel tech part of the, of the conference. So yesterday I was visiting that and, and we have a number uh, of different companies who are providing tech solutions in this industry, exactly using AI technology and other technologies, exactly as you were saying, to help streamline things because I think travel is all about the personal connections that we make. That's what makes the difference of why I go somewhere rather than watch a TikTok video about it. But I, I think that the more technology we have that can help us, as you say, to optimize, to streamline, it allows us to focus on those people to people connections and allows us to just be more efficient, to be better for the environment, um, to, to, uh, to reduce waste, uh, so, so I think, you know, it was very exciting to me as someone who doesn't work full time in this industry to get to know some of these technologies and the passion that people have behind them for the facing the new challenges in this industry. And staying with you and with Iceland. Uh, Iceland is an exceptional tourism destination and um, tourism to Iceland is increasing always. Um, it's about tourism and hospitality. And what can we learn from tourism? We can, I mean, we can learn a lot and we learn, it's, it's, it's about storytelling, you know, I often say, and, and Iceland, uh, in Icelandic is sometimes known as the land of stories because we have this long uh, literary tradition and, and we're the land of the sagas. 
I always think that that's what we remember about visiting a new place is we can we can read the brochure and we can see the videos and things but my experience somewhere is going to be different from your experience and from your experience and your experience and my my story that I come away with will will be different and I think what we're trying to do in Iceland is is generate an ever-changing story for people when they come and we do that through using the technologies that we have to innovate but to build also on the values that we have as a society and the people that everybody meets and you know one of the things i think we're most proud of in this industry is that the vast majority of people who visit iceland say they have a positive experience and people in iceland say that they have a positive response to tourism as well which is i think something that is a little bit more unusual in the industry especially when we live in a country where there's very visible tourism that uh, while we're very aware that the fact that that needs to grow in a, in a sustainable way, that so far in general, people are, are quite positive and very proud to showcase our country to visitors. Talking about people, I just would like to make a jump to labor, labor shortage. Um, so to Bonita and um, Gitta, so to start with Bonita, please. Um, how do you attract and retain staff in Etrigema, um, do you treat young talent differently than older ones? And if so, in what ways? Um, well, yes, um, that's one of our big parts now that we're busy with trying to attract labor because we don't have a large, um, we don't have many people leaving us because they're changing jobs, but also we have, you know, in Germany, a lot of people retiring now. So we have lots of people having to fill these jobs. And what we're trying to do is, I, I don't think there's really such a big difference for us within the people, it's more the ways where you attract them. So we've introduced, um, like we're using Instagram, TikTok and everything to attract um, apprentices and younger workforce. Um, and so we have to have more mediums where we um, uh, sort of advertise for our employment. Um, and what we've also been up to is that we are using more and more from abroad as well. And what helps us is that if we have people that, you know, feel happy at the company, especially people from abroad, they then talk to their family members at home or friends or everything. And then suddenly we have whole communities coming to join us, even though we're living like in the middle of nowhere, sort of in Southwest Germany. So we even have people traveling there from everywhere and we're trying to accommodate them. And I think, I mean, that's what makes us happy to feel that they have a home because what we always say is we are a family business but we also want to have feel our employees to for them to feel at home as a, like as a family in the business yeah Gitta how do you attract and retain staff I try to be brief um, <clears throat> yes it's uh, probably topic number one we speak about uh, uh, around our leadership meetings or in our leadership meetings on how do we get um, uh, uh, more people into our business again after the pandemic. I'm very, very happy to say that some people who left, they come back because they miss it, because they are passionate totally. So this is uh, fantastic news for us. Um, as Bonita said, uh, for us also, the employer branding as such is very uh, crucial. We go uh, to hotel management schools. We also um, have a variety of um, connections if we stay in Germany, of course, Austria, Switzerland, um, uh, to uh, to the uh, to the Chamber of Commerce where we offer apprentices. We have um, uh, around about 500 apprentices in Germany, Austria, Switzerland alone uh, on an annual basis. Talking about retainment, uh, retaining those, uh, we have events for those apprentices to ask them what they need, how can we help them to, um, you know, whatever job they're looking for, how we can help them to uh, to get that job, um, that's number one. And then on the other hand, um, uh, it is also very, very important what I said earlier in terms of retaining people, that the people feel generally taken care of, that they feel treated fairly, that they know I have a job as a front desk agent or I'm a chef or I'm a waiter, I'm a waitress or I'm a manager, but I generally know the core values of what Marriott stands for, no matter what brand I'm working in. So I'm a, I'm a true believer in this um, uh, and and uh, that, that people that, that people stay in a company if they trust generally 
people in the business, in our business. And uh, so we are very proud that our turnover rates uh, in comparison uh, maybe to other chains is, is, is lower. Uh, but of course, we also have, uh, um, like any other tourism in uh, uh, company at the moment, we're, we're constantly looking for more people. Thank you. So to um, have a kind of wrap up, um, I would like to ask a final question to you all before we also answer some questions from the audience. Um, we are at the world's largest tourism trade fair. And um, yeah, how can we create a positive corporate culture in tourism where people enjoy working and really embrace change? Um, maybe start with you also, Gitta. Yeah, basically what I just said before, treat people fair, this is very important, um, but also make sure that they have passion for the business. All of us, uh, many of us here in the room work hard for their money and we want to make sure that they also, that we have fun in, uh, that we enjoy what we do and we try our utmost with uh, Marriott that we give them the platform to understand, yes, work is important, but also make sure that you have a life, <laughs> you know, that you have a life, that you find the work-life balance. Um, and uh, we definitely uh, need to listen to our associates, to our team members, and see what they, um, uh, what, how they tick. Um, so that they feel good about staying in the jobs they have. So be fair, but also have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Eliza? I would say um, appreciation as well. Uh, words like thank you go a long way, I think, and just making people feel seen and, and making people feel heard. And because I've been talking about uh, gender equality, but I would say this idea of role models and, and uh, knowing that we all have an influence and we're all kind of role models and, and, and the importance and the, the power that, that that can have for other people to see, like, I can, I can also do this. Thank you. Bonita? As you said, I think it's important to listen um, to the people and because if they feel sort of satisfied within their work environment, then they're also going to present your product much better to the customer, you know, and if, if it's tourism, if you create an experience or for us, if you sell a product, um, it's important that you feel the product and you know what, you're, what it's representing and that you feel satisfied, you know, representing this um, product or experience. And I think you can do that by making sure your workforce is happy and you listen to them and even though, um, yes, you cannot maybe offer us in our case you know home office etc but you need to make sure that in general you know people like interaction we noticed that during COVID that a lot of employees like to come to the uh, uh, to work because that was the only way there was some sort of interaction and something was happening yeah and I think it's important to sort of give that feeling back to people that it's nice to interact and um, to have a community thank you so let's have a look at the questions we got some um, yeah, maybe just take the first one to Bonita. How challenging has been intercultural management in your company and what specifically has your company done in this regard? So um, we've had sort of different nations joining us over the past few years. I mean, since the 60s, we've had people coming from Turkey, Italy, then um, Eastern Europe. Um, now it's um, since the 2015, we were sort of in our sewing section where we have 600 uh, seamstresses and seamsters. Until 2015, we were only women because in Europe it's seen as a female job, whereas with the immigration crisis from the Middle East, um, we suddenly had quite a few men joining us in this area, so now we have 10% of men. Um, we just, we are always like very quick on our feet. We're just like, okay, you know, if we have someone who's interested in the job, we'll try and int include them into the company. Um, and we just started, I mean, we started with German lessons, everything, but what we, reali we realized is in, um, in Syria, for example, the men were not used to having female plant managers. I mean, we have 72% um, of our uh, managers are women. So um, they weren't used to have group leaders that are women. Um, and we just said, you know, if you want to work with us, then this is the way it's going to work. And now, I mean, I think we also realize that having mixed teams can also sometimes be positive for the outcome, for the production outtake, and also um, for the way people communicate. So our experience has been good. And um, yeah, but we've 
we've, we, we try to communicate with different languages, but uh, we always say we stick to our main language in the long term. Um, but for us now, um, I mean, we've had no, no trouble so far, so we're very happy on that front. And which specific type of value intercultural work workforce brings to your business? Who wants to say something on that? I'll, I'll say something about Iceland a little bit, maybe because I, um, as a, for a country as a whole, because we have a lot of people of foreign origin working in the tourism industry in Iceland. And I myself am of foreign origin, uh, and I, I'm born and raised in Canada. So I, I like to speak a lot in Iceland uh, as an immigrant as well to the country. And of course, in Iceland, not that many people move to Iceland speaking the Icelandic language. So that is, is a challenge, of course. And one of the things that we always do, like you do as well, is provide language lessons, um, assistance in finding housing and things like that. Uh, but when it comes to travel and tourism, well, in general, in Iceland, we have this phrase, which means a guest's eyes see more clearly. And it's this idea that if you come from outside, you can somehow kind of point out different things that maybe you wouldn't know or that you take for granted when you are from the country. So I think from a tourism point of view, you know, if you have a guide on the glacier or, or horseback riding, Uh, or uh, the Lava Show, who is from Poland, for example, they might see things that they think are really exciting and special that if you grew up in Iceland, you would kind of gloss over because you think it's absolutely every day. And, and so I think that is a specific ex advantage of having a very multicultural workforce within this industry in Iceland is the different perspectives that it brings. Just one sentence. I mean, again, hotel business is very... Uh, uh, has a lot of nationalities and, and I just checked this morning uh, we were counting 152 nationalities working in our hotels uh, in uh, 1,300 hotels in Europe, Middle East and Africa. So 152 nationalities and of course different countries, different Uh, you know, majorities of um, uh, um, of different nationalities. So, so uh, we're very uh, welcoming, um, um, or we welcome all of the nationalities. And I think um, this is important also for our business. I think we're running out of time. Maybe one last question from the audience. Um, How uh, have you already established the use of AI assistance in your corporate or national culture? <laughs> Nobody wants to take it because we don't admit. No. <laughs> I think next, on a serious note, I think next year um, we are further along in that process. Also, uh, well, from a Marriott side, I can tell you that a lot of specialists are looking at it right now. At the moment, we are not necessarily uh, uh, working with AI uh, uh, already. I mean, maybe there's this one person who writes a letter with an AI. <laughs> But I mean, the, the, you know, the reservation system, chat boxes and stuff like this, uh, we're, we're looking at all of this. So um, it's a serious topic also to optimize the services. Perfect. So thank you very much for this great discussion we had and all your insights you shared with us. Um, thank you very much, Bonita Krupp, Madam Eliza Reed, And Gitta Brückmann, thank you so much. <laughs>